So this is a very interesting question. The question here is, why are we even computing the receiver operating characteristic and the area under the ROC curve, right? Why are we even doing it? Why can't we just use the probabilistic class label itself and use log loss on top of it? Because we have a log loss as one of the loss functions, right? We also have confusion matrix from which I can compute TPR, FPR, TNR, FNR, all these things. So given all of these, why do I need, what is the fundamental reasoning on why I need ROC or AUC? Very, very important question. Very good question also. As we've hinted at and also explained partly in the videos, but I'll, but I'll go and dive deep on this specific question. So let's take our confusion matrix first. Our confusion matrix has four numbers, right? TPR, FPR, TNR, FNR. So it is not one single number which will help us compare two models. Imagine if I have two models and I want one number or one metric or one key metric that I want to use to compare how good two models are. The problem with confusion matrix is it could so happen that you have model one and model two. Model one's TPR could be more than model two's TPR, but other metrics may be worse off, right? Then how do you, then can you say that model one is better than model two? Because you have four numbers. While some numbers could be better in one model, the other numbers could be better in other model. Now, how do you decide between these two models? And that's the whole rationale on why we, or the whole reasoning, why we would like to have one metric so that we are, of course, it's good to have one primary metric and if need be some secondary metrics, right? Secondary metrics are certainly useful to understand how this model performs in various situations. Right, But a primary metric is very, very important when we have to make a trade-off or when we have to pick one model over the other model. Right, So confusion matrix doesn't satisfy that. But there is an other metric, other two pair of metrics called precision and recall, which we've discussed in the course. And you can combine precision and recall to come up with an F1 score. Right, that, that, that That's an interesting metric in itself. So F1 score is certainly an interesting metric because it's a single metric, right? And F1 score is built. Remember, F1 score is built using precision and recall, not TPR and FPRs or TNRs and, uh, 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 and T, uh, uh, TPR, TNR, TF, uh, um, true, false. Sorry. So let, let me repeat that. It, it's not built using TPR, TNR, FPR and FNR. Okay. It is built using precision and recall. Right. So, uh, by the way, F1 score is used a lot in uh, in in document retrieval, in information retrieval, like examples. Now, let's go back to our uh, log loss. Now, log loss is a very interesting metric, but log loss penalizes you again. Log loss, remember, doesn't use TPR, FPR, etc. Log loss uses the actual class probabilities themselves to see how far away is my predicted probability from the true probability or the true class label, right? So even a small deviation from the true prob probability or the true class label would penalize, would be penalized in the case of log loss. So, so log loss is super important when we care about the probability of the class label being accurate. But imagine if I care about TPR and FPR, and these are very, very important metrics. TPR and FPR are super important in lots of cases because TPR says, okay, how many times am I really correct when I predict something to belong to positive class? And FPR says, whenever I predict a positive class, how many times am I incorrect or at what rate am I incorrect, right? So for lots of problems, TPR and FPR are super duper important, right? Now, how do we mix TPR and FPR? Because they're two metrics, right? Can I somehow combine them to come up with one metric? One such metric is receiver operating characteristic. I'm not saying that's the only metric we have. It is one such metric. And the receiver operating characteristic curve comes from its, uh, so the, again, as the name shows, right? It has actually come from the second world war era of telecommunications. If you look at the name itself, right, it doesn't sound like a computer science or a mathematics name. It sounds like an electronics and communications name because it says receiver operating characteristic. Actually, the receiver operating characteristic was actually designed during the Second World War to understand how effective the radar and missile systems are at, at that point of time, right? So, for example, the TPR could say, 
how accurate whenever i whenever my radar system detects that there is actually a, a plane coming into my country i think uh, roc curves were built by the by the british mathematicians and british engineers during the second world war when german luftwaffe or uh, when german air force was was attacking uh, britain during the during the uh, battle of britain where there was huge tons and tons of raids by german air force or luftwaffe on 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 the british uh, on, on the british soil right again a little bit of history there uh, i think i got my names right i think it's called luftwaffe if i'm not wrong uh, again back back to the discussion here so in such a situation what they wanted to come up with is they wanted to come up with one number which tells them how good is their radar detection system right in their detection system they want to understand how whenever i say that there is an enemy plane in my airspace how many what is my chance of being correct that is nothing but your tpr right if your enemy if if your radar system says that there is an enemy plane in your airspace or in your vicinity what is my tpr my tpr is how many times there is actually a plane there number 1 number 2 fpr is how many times is my radar system saying that there is a plane while there is not a plane there both of them are important right so people started saying can we come up with one metric to combine both tpr and fpr so people said okay let's draw this curve with fpr values on the x axis tpr values on the y axis right and as we change the threshold okay as as tpr changes fpr also will change because what is a model at the end of the day look at a logistic regression model right what it's actually giving us is basically a sigmoid of the distance from the hyperplane effectively that's what your that's what your logistic regression is right and that number need not be exactly a probability it's a real value right if you take the distance because sigmoid is a, is a is a is a monotonic function you can take distance from the hyperplane as a metric now you might want to determine right at what place at what level do you want to set a threshold okay the default threshold in sig when we use a sigmoid function on top of the distances is 0.5 because we are trying to interpret it as a probability but as i change my threshold in my model because what is my model giving me generating an output it is generating not just the class label yi but it is generating me a real value which is sigmoid of the distance from the hyperplane right now i can set a threshold see as i change my threshold or well, let's look at it right imagine if i set uh, imagine if my true positive rate is zero right let let's take a hypothetical situation right if my true positive rate is zero then my false positive rate also will be zero as my tpr increases for my model as i change my threshold as discussed in the video for for receiver operating characteristic as i change my threshold my tpr will increase and my fpr also will increase now people said if i had a random model what would the auc area under this curve be area under this receiver operating characteristic curve be it will be 0.5 right now as the as the, and what is the ideal if i have an oracle an oracle basically here is nothing but something which knows everything in the greek mythology oracles are oracles are future tellers right somebody who knows what the future is and they're absolutely always correct right if i had a perfect oracle or a perfect model its auc will be one so people said yes auc and what 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 lot of machine learning guys borrowed is they've taken great ideas from across the spectrum so this is an idea they've taken from electronics and communication and they've said this is a brilliant idea because now i know that a random model has a value of 0.5 and a perfect model has a value of 1 so whenever somebody tells me that i have an auc of 0.7 i know how good it is right if you think about it because i know that the worst value is 0.5 and the best value is 1 so that's how auc is an A, auc or auroc is an idea that is borrowed from telecommunications and electronics and communication that machine learning people simply borrowed and that's what we do machine learning guys typically borrow ideas from applied mathematics statistics uh, information theory Uh, electronics and communication fundamental computer science etc right i'll give you an alternative interpretation of what auc is okay so there are multiple interpretations of what auc is by the way okay 
So AUC is one number that can summarize all the information that you have in both TPR and FPR. Okay. Some of the very interesting, one very interesting property of AUC is AUC is only rank dependent. Okay, which means if you have two models, right? The two models are basically using using the scores that the models give, the real valued scores that the models give. You can sort these points. You can sort these points based on what is the probability that this point belongs to class one or class zero, right? We can sort these points, right? Now it is only the sort, it is only dependent on the order, not on the exact values that you have because we are thresholding because whether my numbers lie between 0 to 1 or 0 to 100 doesn't matter because at the end of the day, I threshold it at various values and I compute TPR and FPR and I plot it. Okay, so it is a scale independent of the score that the model gives. It doesn't care about the score that the model gives. Unlike log loss, because log loss expects you to give a very accurate probability score which lies between 0 and 1. And even a small perturbation or a small error in the probability score can make your log loss go crazy high. Unlike that, see that's a problem with AUC, with log loss. That's one problem with log loss by the way. It has its own advantages but this is a disadvantage that your probability estimates have to be very very accurate. AUC on the other hand doesn't care about the score that you give. It doesn't care. As long as the score, you might have a score and you have a monotonic function of the score, right? As even if the score changes, this, if the, the, the score is between 0 to 1 or minus 100 to plus 100 doesn't matter. As long as the order amongst the points does not change, AUC remains the same. Because of the way we are computing it, we threshold it, at very, we first sort it, threshold it, compute TPR, FPR and plot it. Right? That's another thing. There is a other probabilistic interpretation of AUC, which is a very interesting interpretation, which goes as follows. So, uh, the, the, the logic behind it is, Let's assume I say that my model has an AUC of 0.75. Okay, how do you interpret it probabilistically? There is one very interesting interpretation. The interpretation goes as follows. Suppose if you take one point from the positive class and one point from the negative class. Okay, suppose you pick up one point from the positive class, one point from the negative class. Then if my model has, but I don't know which point is which. Okay, suppose somebody, somebody gives me a point from the positive class, one point from the negative class, but that they don't tell me which point is positive class, which point is negative class. They don't tell me yet. Now, if I pass these two points through my model, and if the AUC of the model is 0.75, what it implies is that there is a 75% chance that I will accurately classify these points as positive and negative. Okay. So that's, that's an other probabilistic interpretation of AUC. So let me repeat it. If somebody gives me one point from positive class and one point from negative class without telling me which point belongs to which class, they just give me two points and they guarantee that one of these points belongs to positive class, one of these points, to, points belong to negative class. Now, if the AUC of my model is 0.75, then if I pass these two models through my, through my uh, pass these two points through my model, right? There is a 75%, 75% because of 0.75. There is a 75% chance that I'll correctly classify these points. Okay, so this is a probabilistic interpretation of AUC. I hope this gives you a much broader picture, both historically, the historical perspective, the more uh, real world applied perspective behind AUC.